Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have one of my favorite modern authors joining us this week. I think a lot of you will be familiar with at least some of his work. He is a grandmaster, the two-time, uh, a two-time Swedish Olympiad team member, and he has written four books that are all excellent. He has written uh, Pump Up Your Rating, co-authored The Woodpecker Method with Grandmaster Hans Tikkanen, um, The E3 Poison, and this year he is out with a new book with Quality Chess. All of his books are with Quality Chess, and this one is called Street Smart Chess. And I am excited to talk about all of them. He also saw a very impressive rating gain in his early 20s. So he's um, he, he uh, walked the walk in addition to talking the talk. Um, he raised his rating from about 2,100 feet A to 2,450 in less than two years at that time, as, of course, is famously discussed in Pump Up Your Rating and Woodpecker Method in particular. Um, and, of course, his friend Hans Tikkanen also had some great success. So without further ado, we'll be discussing all this stuff, but let's welcome him to the show. Grandmaster Axel Smith, how are you? I'm fine, and thanks, Ben. Nice to be here. Yeah, I'm, su I'm super excited. I'm a big fan of your books. Um, and so we were just discussing before recording, you're joining us from, from Sweden, Axel, your native Sweden. Where in Sweden are you? Uh, we live in the southwest part of Sweden, in Lund, a uh, university city. Uh, okay, and how, how is life there? How is um, the pandemic in particular? Uh, I think it's fine, at least for me and my family. We are still visiting friends and, uh, and relatives uh, with a bit more res responsibility than normally. And the kids have to stay home from school when they are a little bit sick, but uh, I think that's fantastic. You can be home with uh, a kid that is not really sick. That's a lot of energy. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So it sounds. Oh, and uh, and with uh, all the chess tournaments and other stuff cancelled, you have more time with family, and so we enjoy that as well. Yeah. Same here. I mean, as I've said on the podcast before, anyone who's in reasonable health uh, can't complain too much under these circumstances. And Axel, as we mentioned before, we pressed record. Of course, we're recording in the middle of the candidates, which keeps us entertained. But we're not going to talk about that because by the time yeah. listeners hear about this, they will know the winner. Um, so let's get to your, your books, Axel. As I've mentioned, we're, I'm a big fan. And in fact, a uh, friend of the show, Neil Bruce, and I even did a podcast about the Woodpecker Method, which of course has been um, especially popular amongst like, uh, you know, uh, adult chess players aspiring to improve a very sort of uh, original um, approach. And of course, a lot of people have kind of followed in your footsteps. But for any listeners who aren't familiar with the famed woodpecker method, Axel, could you uh, tell its story just um, in, in brief? Uh, yeah, it was uh, my friend uh, and uh, the Grandmaster Hans Tikkanen who invented it, you can say. But of course, it was not his own idea from the beginning. But back then, we trained a lot together. And uh, when I visited him, I saw him. Uh, he had a lot of books about science, about the brain, and uh, also chess books. But when I asked him about his projects, he didn't want to say anything. Mm. And that was not because he wanted to keep it uh, secret. It was just because he didn't want to tell anything uh, until he had tested it on himself and he was uh, knowing more what to say. And then uh, that summer, he improved a lot. He did his woodpecker method uh, during the spring and then he had fantastic results during the summer. And the idea is basically that you do some uh, uh, tactical exercises, not too hard. Uh, and you do them uh, maybe several hundred, and then you repeat them over and over again. And for each session, uh, you repeat and you do it a little bit faster. And then finally, maybe you should be able to do them all in one day. And, and the idea is to develop some automatic pattern recognition that helps. It will make you calculate faster, but also more exact. Yeah, and I understand that, of course, uh, as you mentioned, Hans Tiekenen had great success with it, as you wrote about in Pump Up Your Rating and then Woodpecker Method. And then you undertook this project yourself, correct? Yeah, I did also do the same, because I was, of course, impressed with his uh, results. And uh, yeah, 
it requires a lot of effort, but I had a time and I had a ambition back then. And we <laughs> you, make it, you make it sound like you don't I have managed, those things yeah. anymore. <laughs> huh. So do you not have the same time and ambition as uh, you actually, did uh, when, in those years? Uh, when I started to become serious with chess, I did not have any outspoken goals. I was just uh, curious to learn chess, to know more. And then suddenly I had some good results and I thought, okay, I can become a grandmaster, maybe in a year. And a year later, I was not even better than I was uh, a year before. And it took me, I think, eight years after I said that until I became a grandmaster. Uh, and when I fin finally succeeded, I thought, okay, this is, this is it. It will be very, very hard to improve uh, more. Uh, probably it's possible. But yeah, I have an other interest as well. So since 2016, I have not had any ambitions really, but I enjoy playing and I still want to win the Swedish championship. So for a month before that tournament, I'd, I come back to training chess uh, seriously. Yeah, well, first of all, I just wanted to say, I mean, a lot of people say they're going to become grandmaster and don't even make it. So a lot of us would sign up for taking eight, for it, taking eight years to do it. Um, but I know you've also, I believe you mentioned in Street Smart Chess, or maybe it was in our correspondence, that you you still do Woodpecker Method getting ready for for a tournament. So, and for example, for, for example, the Swedish national championship. So when you return to the puzzles, having done it all this time, how, how good is your recall uh, at this point? And no, it's not perfect at all. And even, even if I recognize the puzzle and I think I know the answer, I try to calculate through the variation as if I have not seen the position before. Uh, and I think that is the idea also to do that. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because I've been doing a lot of space repetition. I've done the woodpecker method, although full disclosure, I didn't make it all the way through the advanced puzzles. Um, I'm rated, I'm like 21 to 2200. Um, and, um, and I've noticed that it's a strange feeling when you come across puzzles that you know you've seen before, but you can't remember the answer. And I feel like my brain often doesn't know what to do. Should it be trying to recall or should it be calculating? So in, in that situation, what do you recommend? Uh, to calculate, I think. And I, I think it's quite normal that you remember the solution, but actually when you check uh, the answer later on, you realize that you remember the wrong solution, the one you found, yeah. found the last time, but <laughs> was not correct. And if you do yeah. like that, then you, this is a sign that you are trying to recall too much and calculate too little. Okay. Yeah, there's that issue. Sometimes also I can remember the answer, but nothing else. Like no, <laughs> no corresponding moves. I just know that what the right first move is. Yeah. And, but, and sometimes I have that feeling and even that's wrong. Yeah, okay, but then then you have to calculate because yeah, we are there to practice. It should it, yeah. it should be hard. It should not be too easy. Yeah, this is true. Um so of course I get the sense, I don't know how many books, and of course it's also uh quite popular on Chessable, uh the Woodpecker Method. So I don't know how many books or courses uh Woodpecker Method has sold, but certainly amongst the um online chess community, it seems to be extremely popular. So Axel, I'm curious, how often do stories about people doing the woodpecker method reach you? What, ha what have you heard from readers? Yeah, quite often, actually. I get some pictures in, uh, they bring the book to strange places. And uh, mm -hmm. some players that says, oh, I improved 600 points uh, when doing this book 10 times. And I started to even become a member in the club for the first time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure if it's uh, true or not. Yeah. Well, the next time someone interviews you, I mean, tells you that they gained 600 points, have them email me because I want to interview them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I only know um, the first name of this person. I don't, don't even know the last name. Okay. Well, uh, we'll, we'll correspond about that offline. Yeah. Um, and uh, your friend Hans Tikkanen, um, what's going on with his chess game? Has, has his ambition also dialed back a bit? Yeah, I think he also decided that uh, a life as a chess player is not what he would will appreciate. And it was his interest in science and in brain uh, made him study psychology. So, oh, so okay. since, since a few years now, he has finished his studies and works as a psychologist. Okay. So Still might be an, he is not an playing much chess, uh, much chess uh, nowadays. Okay. And if you don't mind my asking, Axel, what about you? Are you working as a chess trainer or uh, just writing your books on the side? Uh, I'm an editor for the Swedish chess magazine. So that's my 
main income. So okay. and and I'm writing in some uh, newspapers in Sweden as well. So maybe I'm working fifty percent half time. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so I had a few more questions about uh, Woodpecker Method, and then of course there's um, there's uh, so many other other books to discuss. Um, so one question I had, and I've I've actually speaking of um, Hans Tieken and studying psychology, I've interviewed a few cognitive scientists who are also uh, chess enthusiasts, like uh, Dr. Christopher Chabri um, and uh, Jana um, Jana from. Um, Thinkers Publishing, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, Yana Kravetz. Sorry about that, Yana. Um, <laughs> so, and one question I wonder is, we know from reading the scientific literature that you alluded to that uh, space repetition is definitely helpful for um, memorizing things such as opening sequences. But when it comes to tactics, um, it's, it's not as clear to me that it would be as useful as just getting better at calculating. So how do you think about the, the difference between um, pattern recognition and calculating and like how um, a player who wants to improve should balance working on the two? Yeah, I, I think yeah, you're talking about spaced repetition and uh, okay, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an expert in that, but I think the point with that is to remember things and uh, you should repeat them with longer and longer intervals. It's right. Yes. Uh, you should not repeat anything too often because then it's too easy. The brain has to work to, yeah, to improve memory. But here you are not trying to remember things. You are more like trying to get some automatic pattern recognition in your brain. So I, I don't think it's really the same uh, same thing. Uh, and here you should also not have longer uh, intervals between the sessions. So you should do it quicker uh, for each time. Uh, okay, and, and just out of curiosity, when you do pick back up the woodpecker method, when you ramp up your training for the national championship, yeah. how well do you remember uh, these puzzles at this point? Actually, I, I, I use other books as well, so I'm not only using oh, the woodpecker method. I'm using so, the method, but I'm not only using that book. Yeah, so of course you're a grandmaster, so your your recommendations won't apply to everyone listening. But just out of curiosity, what what other uh, what other books or resources do you like? Uh, I'm doing some of this uh, the chess.com tactics trainer. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, then you get a random sample of exercises. But when you have made a lot of exercises, and I've really made a lot there, then you get get them back over and over again. Also. Yeah, yeah, I know some people really um, pump up their ratings by uh, by by memorizing all of the puzzles. Although yeah. I've heard that that's getting harder to do. And uh, actually, I think they are a bit too difficult. But oh, okay, they're also quite beauty when when you find a solution uh, of a difficult yeah. puzzle. So yeah. Now, Axel, I, I interview um, title players all the time for this show, and some are of the opinion that you need to do like analog training. You need to actually set up a chess set. And a book is better than a tactics trainer. So I'm getting the sense that, that that's not, I mean, you know, no one knows the correct answer, but I'm getting the sense that that's not your opinion. You're, you're fine with doing this stuff on computer. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I, I don't like screens too much, <laughs> actually. But I think for the woodpecker method, it's, it would be good to, I, I've not uh, used Chessable for the woodpecker, but I, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, it's good to do it there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I always, I mean, I, I obviously I'm a big fan of Chessbone. In fact, we'll be taking a break to hear an ad from them in a second. But I always say tactics and uh, opening courses in particular are are what it's uh, what it's best for. Yeah, be, so because if, that, if you use a book uh, and if you want to put the pieces on a board, then you use a lot of time just for this practical thing instead of really training. Yeah, yeah. So, so point, if no. you need to go through the solutions, then it would be better to do it to do it on a screen. Yeah, and also people like us with uh, with kids running around at home, it can be hard to like uh, have the, you know, the the quiet moment to set up the chess set. Uh, whereas you can just take out your phone and do some tactics. Yeah, and when you come back, the chess set has a different position, probably. <laughs> exactly, or someone tried to eat one of the pieces, or or, or yeah. whatever it may be. Um, so on that note, Axel, we're going to take a break to hear from our friends at Chessable, and then I want to talk a little bit about uh, pump up your rating before we get to your new book. This is your weekly reminder that Chessable.com has a ton of high quality material, whether you're looking to learn a certain opening 
want to see the latest Super GM repertoire that has been published, want to find a tactics course appropriate for your level, whatever it may be, go to chessable.com and have a look around. Don't forget they have tons of cool free content too, like their short and sweet courses about various openings. And all of the things that they offer feature their proprietary move trainer technology, the secret sauce that lets you actually remember all of the new chess moves and opening sequences that you learn. So once again, chessable.com, check out their ever-expanding excellent library. So Axel, uh, Pump Up Your Rating is also quite a well-rated book, and a lot of, uh, a lot of the players I've interviewed on the show have recommended it. Um, and, and in that book you list, and of course this was, uh, I believe, your first book, and in it, you list four key components of chess improvement, which are number one, analyzing your games and making a list of mistakes. Number two, using a De La Maza-esque program to study tactics, which now we would call a woodpecker method-esque um, program. Uh, number three, doing serious opening work via the creation of opening files in chess base. Now that one, for, for players rated below 1800, you might need to modify that in some way. But first, I'll, I'll just read them and then we'll discuss. Number four, um, master it, mastering approximately 100 key theoretical endgames. So I found that advice to be pretty useful and pretty sort of uh, holistic. Um, has your thinking evolved about that at all? Or do you stand by those uh, four tenets, Axel? Uh, what if not in the list is playing. Right, yeah, good point. And uh, maybe... When when I wrote this book, yeah, there was no other life for me. I was playing every tournament I could. I played some 200 games some years. Uh, and But now when I'm playing one or two tournaments a year, I notice that playing is a good way to practice. If you don't play, you are getting rusty. Yeah, I think it... I think... Uh, so add, add, play, add, add playing, of course, as number one, maybe, in, in this list. Yeah, it's easy to take but, that uh... for granted. But but I think you're, I think you're right. I mean, yeah, because yeah, you, you do have analyzing your games as number one but you need games to analyze so um, yeah. and and for those for those end games uh, I, I think it's not the most important thing but uh, compared to the others it's quite easy to do to to get a good opening repertoire you need to spend years and uh, a lot of hours but this uh, end games you can maybe do them in a month and then you are done and then you need to repeat them a few times but not much more than that so it's maybe not the most important but it's so easy to do so you have to, you have to do them okay yeah because that's another one where you get some mixed reports from the people i talk to about whether or not you need to know the strictly theoretical ones or if it makes more sense just to sort of study the end game masters um so do you have, I'm putting you on the spot here, Axel, but do you have any specific for people who do want to learn those key end games? Obviously, there's lots of resources out there. Do you, do you have any favorites? Uh, it was a long yeah. time ago now. I, di I, I did my own database and then I repeated from my own okay. comments uh, after that. But I'm sure there are many yeah, good books. And, uh, yeah, and, and of course, of being works. that you mentioned the number 100, 100 end games you must know comes to mind for me. Um, now... Regarding openings, and I noticed this in uh, Street Smart Chess as well, um, I think Street Smart Chess in particular is probably geared towards like the higher rated club player, I would say maybe 1800 um, and higher. Now, a lot of our listeners uh, are, of course, familiar with what chess space is, but may not have it or may not feel that it's necessary because their games are, are often being decided by sort of um, uh, tactics or um, like fairly large mistakes. Um, so I don't know if you're the right person to ask, so feel free to pass if you don't think you are, but do you, do you have any ideas about like substitutes for developing an opening file or sort of a modified version for, um, for, uh, players who are not really at the, uh, chess base, stockfish, Leela, grandmaster prep level? Uh, when I was young, I, I had my opening repertoire in Excel. Oh, wow. And it was like uh, font uh, eight or six or something very, very small. And uh, it was a space for 14 moves. After 14 moves, the page was done. So I could not write more than 14 moves. And I had like five or six pages with uh, very a lot of moves there. <laughs> this was also before I used chess space. <laughs> but okay, th this is not something uh, to recommend. That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Nowadays, I, I for myself, I try to be less ambitious with openings. Uh, 
just to read a book and then try to play it without even uh, creating an opening file. But uh, yeah, every time I try, I finally end up making a file anyway because <laughs> this is the way I've been grown up. To yeah, do. that reminds me. I've been actually I've gotten sidetracked by some other podcast book projects, but I was reading E Three Poison um, prior to us scheduling this interview. And you say something interesting, and I, I recommend that book for anyone looking for um, a sort of um, solid setup for white that's not as theoretical. And in the in the intro to that book, you refer to chess um, op possibly entering a sort of post-theoretical. Um, so that's in that's in air quotes era. Um, so could you could you explain what you mean by that a little bit, Axel? And the the post-theoretical yeah. era. That what was your yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, before the computers, uh, there was not so much theory compared to today. So finding uh, concrete lines and more theory was it always paid off. Uh, and also the, when uh, the computers started to make analysis, analysis, it was more and more openings you can uh, examine. But nowadays, I think it's it's like. Yeah, many openings are not worked out, but many lines are worked out. And if you want to surprise your opponent, it's harder to do it. So then people uh, in the the top players, they are more trying to surprise the opponent, get a playable position instead of trying to really prove an advantage with white. And I think uh, for that reason, people are starting to play less theoretical lines than before, just just to get a game with white, because you can't really get an advantage anyway. So, yeah, yeah I, it does not pay off. It not, does not pay off so well to go into these theoretical lines. Yeah, I I actually saw a quote from Anish Giri just the other day. Obviously, with the candidates um, ongoing, someone retweeted something where he he said when when he's getting ready for a tournament like the candidates. His primary objective is to surprise his opponents rather than so back. Yeah. And I think, uh, okay, this is for the very best in the world, but I think also for club players, this it's some true in this because even for the average club player, there are many more books available uh, and many more. It's much easier to find games in chess base and so on. So even the average club player knows his openings much better. So you need to surprise in that level as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask about, because I think what a lot of club players struggle with, and as a dad, I'm sure you can relate to this, is we, we feel like we have, um, we have so, much, so many holes in our game to work on. And on the other hand, it's, so, it's easier than ever for someone to look up what openings we play. So you don't want to be a sitting target. But on the other hand, if you feel like, you know, your end games are bad, your tactics are bad, you know, your, you know, every phase of your game needs improvement. It can be hard to be like, okay, I'm going to have three different opening lines that I'm going to trot out, um, keep my opponents yeah. off balance. Do, do you have any <laughs> suggestions or is it just like an unsolvable problem? Yeah, working on openings is maybe not the most uh, efficient way, but if it's enjoyable, that's uh, important as well. And also, when you work in openings, you can you work in other parts uh, of the game as well. If you try to calculate uh, in the same time as you analyze, just just don't look at the computer to see plus and minus. Uh, and also, to try to understand the type of position. You learn other parts of the game as well. So, I think working on openings, it it it's not. The idea is not to find an advantage for white, it's to learn chess. Yeah, yeah. And again, that brings it back to E3 Poison, where you talk, you talk about the fact that you're not, you're not emphasizing um, memorizing moves as much as sort of learning typical structures and seeing a few games um, in action. Um, yeah. So, and of course, both in uh, Pump Up Your Rating and in Street Smart Chess, you you kind of um, lean on the work of uh, other grandmasters, players players you've looked up to. So it, it made me wonder, Axel, is there a, a player or a trainer who has influenced you more than any other? Uh, there are a few players in Sweden. Uh, when, when I was young, we had a grandmaster from Malmö, Stellan Brunel. He came to our club and he was going to play a simul. And I, I heard he played it French. So I thought it was a good idea to play the French myself. So I played one e6 and then I, I did not know the second <laughs> move. So I did not play d, d5. <laughs> and then I continued to play that French for 10 years. 
but since he was uh, visiting our club uh, from time to time, he, yeah, I looked up to him and uh, he was also the first, first grandmaster, I bet. It was in a rapid game, but I was very happy. Maybe a bit too happy, actually, <laughs> afterwards. Maybe not the best winner. <laughs> so sorry, what was the grandmaster's name? Uh, Stellan Okay. Rinal, and so name. obviously, so, so uh, too happy. And I think he's a quite, quite a good practical player also, so you can learn things from him. And so did he... How did you react? What did he get upset when you were uh, overly excited for beating him? Yeah, I, I think I just mentioned it a bit uh, too <laughs> many times. But uh, then, then he just uh, told me, "Look at the final standings in the tournament. Where are you and where are I?" <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> yeah, and he, he was clearly yeah. ahead of me. <laughs> um, and then uh, a second player is of course uh, Ulf Andersson. Uh, we had some sessions with him uh, in Lund. Uh, when I was starting to become a strong player and it was incredible to see him analyze. He's very, very humble, but he, even so he has an opinion of every position. He can just see a position and in no time he can uh, explain what he thinks, the plans for both players. Uh, and his interest for chess is never ending. He can yeah, do chess all day. Yeah, he's and uh, this and this is after 50 years of playing professionally. So uh, yeah, it was incredible to see him. Yeah, he's an absolute legend. And um, uh, Grandmaster Johan Helsten, I believe, is um from Sweden originally, right? Yeah, yeah and he true. he did a video with uh, U.S. Chess School where he goes through some of uh, Ulf Anderson's um uh, end games, and it's um it's amazing stuff. Definitely, I'll link to that and definitely recommend uh, listeners check it out um okay so axel we've we're going to hear from another sponsor we're going to hear from our friends at aim chess and then i want to talk about the new book not every chess player has a janitor to help them improve at chess like beth Harmon did for those of you who don't there is aimchess.com aim chess has a web-based algorithm that collects and analyzes your games from chess.com or lee chess and then it creates personalized study plans based on your weaknesses to help you improve it might highlight specific openings to work on tell you to tighten up your tactics or in my case tell me to manage my time better then it gives you puzzles and advice with the goal of helping you improve your chess faster. You can check out Aim Chess for free. And then if you decide to subscribe, please use the promo code CHESS30 to save 30%. That's CHESS30. The details are also in the show notes. So for now, let's get back to the interview. So Axel, I've, I've really enjoyed Street Smart Chess as well. I'm really impressed with um, the consistent quality of uh, the output of your books. And um, we should mention, by the way, that these books are available on Forward Chess, which I always enjoy reading that way. And there's also um, a free excerpt of of uh, Street Smart Chess in particular on Quality Chess and probably the older books uh, as well. But so you you um, relied on some friends for this book. Could you could you explain um, the structure of the book to our listeners? Uh, not really friends. It's model players uh, in the world's elite. So I think this book is uh, maybe discussing a theme that is not a part of Pump Up Your Rating at all. Uh, practical chess, how to play against weaker players, against stronger players, how to play when you want to avoid theory or when you want to make the game theoretical. Uh, and to do so, I, I was wanted to learn from the an expert in every field. So I contacted some players that are known to be good and in those things and yeah some accepted to uh, be a part of the book uh, some of my wishes i could not get but, uh, <laughs> i think yeah, i might know i will not mention any names <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so yeah he's got a, a chap you've got a chapter from uh grandmaster david navara who a uh, legendarily nice guy who's been on the podcast i think that was my uh my favorite chapter how to beat lower rated opponents um from Aryan Tari, who are, Tari, excuse me, who I believe you've uh, worked with in the past, uh, Grandmaster Adiban, Grandmaster Laurent Fressonet, um, and Magnus's trainer Peter Hein Nielsen, and then there's a chapter about Magnus, and the conspicuous in his absence is Magnus Carlson, but he's <laughs> yeah. a busy guy. We understand. Um, um, so, so amazing stuff. And as I mentioned to you in email, it's funny that you mentioned practical chess because it reminds me of the book. Uh, Secrets of Practical Chess by John Nunn, which you said you, you have not read, correct? Yeah, that's correct. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit below your level at this point, but, but I think you would see um, some similarities, which is a compliment. I think they're both, um, they're both highly useful books. Again, I think it's for the um, pr best for players rated over 1800, but there's definitely, it's one of those books um, where there's nuggets to be extracted no matter your level. Yeah, um, so, I, I, I will read it. I enjoy reading chess books, of course, so I will check it out. Oh yeah, yeah. I think uh, you, you'll you'll find it uh, worth worth reading. Mm -hmm. um, so you tell, in addition to, of course, the chess instruction, which is um, not wholly relatable on an audio only podcast. You tell some stories about just spending time uh, with these players, like for example, um, you know, going for walks in the woods with Grandmaster Navara and your, your general interactions with him. Could you, could you share a few of those stories for us? Yeah, Navarra, he's extremely generous with his time. It was uh, nice to meet him. Uh, we had a long session there in, uh, in his home city, uh, pra, Prague. And uh, afterwards, he sent uh, me a lot of emails, uh, correcting things, improving uh, the text, improving the variations. Uh, yay! I didn't uh, really know how to react because he was so so friendly uh, and so so generous. Yeah, very very commonly uttered words about uh, Grandmaster Navarra. I've also had good interactions with him and heard heard nothing but good things. And again, I really um, I really enjoyed his advice about uh, beating lower rated players uh, as well. I mean, he really has obviously given a lot of thought to that because he plays a lot of. Uh, Bundesliga and other league type games. Um, yeah, and then uh, Grandmaster Tari, I I enjoyed that um, you you sort of you quoted him talking about sort of the the struggles of deciding whether and how seriously to pursue chess. Obviously, he was I believe he was a world junior champion. Obviously, a top junior player, but still, um, uh, anyone who's not on a world championship track or even some who are um, might have to decide at some point. So what was it like hearing him him talk about that? It, it would have been easier for him to live in another country because he lives in Norway, one of the most expensive countries. And to make a living uh, as a chess player is, of course, more difficult there than it is in a cheaper country. Uh, but I've not met him now for some time due to the pandemic. So maybe he's still struggling if he wants to go ahead as a professional player or he wants to make a civil career. But I hope he will play chess because yeah, w when he plays, he enjoys it, I think. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's tough. And obviously someone someone who's achieved as much as he has in chess, obviously if, if he applied that intellect to other fields, there's, there's great potential in what he could do. But on the other hand, chess is a great game and obviously chess is booming in Norway. So it's, you know, you would hope that that players like him could could find a way to make a, a good living. Yeah, and um, of course you should mention that as well. There are some advantages to live in Norway, chess wise, of course. Yes, you, you would think, but I, you know, I interviewed um, Grandmaster Jun Ludwig Hammer in the very early days of this podcast, um, probably uh, uh, 2017, and he also mentioned, and I think like he might be an example of someone for whom things are going better because he does Twitch streaming and of course um, does some stuff for Play Magnus. Um, but he also mentioned just how hard it was um, in, in Norway in particular because it's so, so expensive. Yeah. Um, did that, if you don't mind my asking, uh, I know you lived in France um, for, for several years. Did, did cost of living impact that decision or was it just your, your love of the mountains? Uh, we just wanted to enjoy another culture and learn the language better. My, my wife is a French teacher, so she, she speaks French. And uh, yes. Yeah. No, the, the cost of living, uh, it, it doesn't matter for us because we don't buy things, so we have no, no real cost okay. at all. Yeah. Uh, that's a good way to live. Um, and getting back to uh, Street Smart Chess, so I think I mentioned, I, I believe my favorite chapter was Navarra's chapter, but I did find them all to be useful. Um, and these are these grandmasters, I mean, they, they clearly gave you a lot of their time. They're annotating games for you in the book um, with, with lots of insights. But I was curious if you had a favorite chapter yourself, Axel. I, it's the same, uh, the Navarra chapter. Yeah. Have you, I'm again putting you on the spot, but have you read his book? Uh, I 
think I read one book, but there is another one coming that is not really printed. I tried to order it, but I got a message that it could not be sent yet. Yeah, there's a new one that's a collaboration with uh, Marcos, I believe. Yeah, um, it is, it's that one. But I read one of his, uh, My Chef World, I think the title is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that one's supposed to be amazing. And I unfortunately have not gotten a chance to read it yet. But um, yeah, yeah, do it. Yeah, I, it's it's high on the list. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, yeah, uh, I'll for, make for, it for my own books, I do not really read them. Uh, the Woodpecker Method, of course, I did a lot of times, but Spirit Matches, I have not really opened yet because I'm, I'm afraid of finding some silly mistakes when I open <laughs> the book. <laughs> yeah, and that one was a unique um, structure because you're, you're leaning so heavily on the insights of, um, of the, the elite players that, that we mentioned. Um, so, how did you go about that? Did, was it like Skype phone calls or emails? Or I know you spent time in person with Grandmaster Navarra. What was the approach for these different chapters? Mm, I, I think I met uh, maybe half the players in person, and then it was Skype calls with the rest. Okay. If I remember correct. Yeah. And then I, I have to ask Axel, <laughs> in, in the introduction to Street Smart Chess, you of course thank um, our friends at Quality Chess, um, Grandmaster Shaw and uh, Grandmaster Agard, and for, for publishing all of your books. Although I know that Woodpecker Method in particular has sold so many copies that I'm sure they're, and your books are so good that I'm sure they're, they're happy to sell them. But you say your next book is going to be uh, sort of even more out there. So I have to ask like, uh, what you have in mind. Yeah, I, I got this question once before, and then I couldn't even remind what I was <laughs> thinking of <laughs> because I wrote this preface, I think, a year and a half ago. It was oh, a long wow. time ago. Oh wow! Okay. But uh, but now I I think I I was thinking of a book uh, with the title Climate Gambit to gather some openings and make a repertoire, but and uh, find some quite strange connections to climate. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. But and are you still thinking of doing that, or do you and, have something else in mind now? Uh, no, I'm not uh, thinking of this idea anymore. Actually, I'm writing a book uh, about the uh, Swedish champion uh, in 1967, who had a brilliant career, but very short. He he quit chess just a few years uh, later, but he had an interesting life as well. Oh, but, interesting. Uh, that that would, book will be in Swedish, so it's, okay. it will not really be for a broad uh, audience. Yeah, and and you mentioned um, in our emails that you primarily learned English um, through reading chess books, which um, your your English is great, by the way. Um, but it made me wonder, do you write in English or do you write in Swedish for uh, no, these books? I, I write in uh, English. Okay. But, but I edit myself a lot. Yeah, so so that's why I prefer to to write instead of uh, like doing a podcast like here. <laughs> it's right. nice to be here, but uh, the possibility to change what you have written over and over again. It's I, I like that. Yeah, well, I I, I and the listeners appreciate you doing this because um because we've got a a lot of fans um a lot of fans of your books, um, listening myself included. Um, so I also. I also was, so your next project is going to be this biography um, and you're writing about the candidates right now, which, which will be already out. So we won't speculate about the, the world championship. Um, so what kind of stuff when you write for the, the Swedish chess periodicals, what kind of stuff are you covering the news or are you writing like um, improvement articles or all of the above? Uh, it's only four issues per year, so you can't really have much news. Everything is already old uh, when the magazine comes to the people. So I try to do some uh, more some longer text about players, about tournaments, but not really about a specific event. To try to find things that you cannot find in the internet. Oh, interesting. Uh, and of course, I'm not writing the whole magazine. I'm also editing it and uh, getting articles from other uh, writers. Well. Okay. And I get the sense from your writing, you know, you're talking about players like Niels Grandelius, who uh, you've, you know, obviously, um, and um, uh, Tiger Halap Person. Um, I get the sense it's a pretty close knit grandmaster community in Sweden, but I don't, I don't have a strong sense what what the chess culture is like there more broadly. What, how is the chess culture in Sweden? Uh, 
Uh, I think it's good. Uh, for, for me, I was fortunate to live in Lund, where we had a lot of ambitious players, and four of them became uh, GMs uh, in, in the same uh, time period. And we also have some other GMs joining us. Uh, but I think it's good. Uh, the federation is quite active with chess in schools and also for the elite players. Uh, we had weekend tournaments, so there is a lot of online uh, tournaments as well. No, I think it's good for, for the player who want to live uh, on chess. Maybe a problem is that uh, Swedes are not used to pay for their trainers. So it's difficult to live, uh, to make a living as a trainer in Sweden. There is no culture to, to pay for such things. So what, how is it arranged? Like they, it's just expected to be done without compensation? Uh, yeah, the, the clubs have some trainers and uh, this is done on a voluntary basis normally. Oh, not the, I, I like this system, but it's for the professional players, it's harder. Yeah, yeah, that, that, does, sound, um, that, that does sound pretty challenging. Um, so I've only got a couple more questions for you, Axel. One is um, I often like to ask my the podcast guests uh, for for their own favorite chess books. What what were some of some of your favorites? Uh, okay, I liked uh, Marines Learning from the Legends. Yeah, uh, a lot. Uh, I should read it again when I when I think about it. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of books uh, I like. Uh, yeah, Grandmaster Naroditsky also is a big fan of Learn from the Legends. That's a that's another one that I've I've heard recommended so much. I really I really need yeah. to read it. There um, is a, I think an author Willie Hendricks maybe. Yeah, he, I'm a big fan. I yeah I got to interview him as well, but a big fan of both uh, Move First Think Later and um, on the Art yeah, of yeah, Good Move. Yeah, that Move First Think Later. That was the title I was thinking about. Yeah. That yeah. was a, a splendid book, I think. Yeah, I agree. Very very original. Um, and our, so we were we were discussing our kids before we started recording. You've got um, a three and a five year old, so they're a bit young. But are they doing any chess yet? Uh, the the three year old is uh, chatting while we others are playing chess. He's, he, 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 when you listen to him, he, he, you you will think he's a chess player. He can say, "Oh, the the knight should jump, and uh, oh, the the king should advance." But he cannot play. He don't know the rules at all. He's just listening to the talk and repeating the same things. Huh. Uh, but our our daughter, who is seven, she has just started to play. Uh, me and my wife, we were thinking that she should not play chess. It's yeah, it's too time consuming. There are other things <laughs> in life. But then uh, when my wife saw this Queen's Gambit uh, <laughs> last autumn, the first TV series she ever saw, she was, oh, chess is quite nice anyway. So maybe it's a good time to start now when she's seven. So she uh, started to play a little. Uh, and for me, it was mostly that, like, uh, there are no big challenges for her in the school because she started school when she was four in, uh, in France. So she went to school there for a year and a half before coming back to Sweden. And then she started from the first grade again in Sweden. And for, I think for a year or so, I I tried to have an impact on the school that she should get some harder tasks. After two years here in Sweden, she is still trying to learn to write the letters, but she learned it like three or four years ago. Huh. Uh, okay. But okay, yeah. now my wife, uh, she will not listen, so I can say what I want. But I think that the <laughs> Swedish school is not working so well. So maybe then uh, I've resigned now. I will not try more. So it's better that she, that she plays chess instead. Then, you yeah, have, so then she has a big challenge. Something to grow the mind so of your she, wife. So is... she started to play uh, like uh, a few weeks ago only. But she, she enjoys it. And your wife is a chess player as well, correct? Uh, yeah, that's true. So it's funny to me that even your wife, who's a, a tournament strong player, tournament chess player, even she is impacted by the Queen's Gambit boom. Even she decides to start your daughter in chess once, yeah, and, once uh, she sees the show. Yeah, and after some years of not playing at all, she started to practice also for herself after this Queen's Gambit. That's funny. And did you watch it with your wife? Uh, yeah, but she, she watched, watched it uh, another time, a second time. I did not. Okay. What did you think of it? Uh, oh, I like it as a, uh, yeah, as a TV series. 
but uh, <laughs> of course it's not so realistic right yeah but but entertaining and well done in, yeah. in my opinion um Okay, and last thing. So, of course, you've mentioned you you have interests outside of chess. So, what else is occup occupying your time besides uh, chess and family, Axel? Uh, yeah, I think my my main interest is running uh, the marathon. Oh wow! Uh, I'm running like uh, 20 kilometers a day, so I think I spend uh, more time running than working. <laughs> wow! Every day? Uh, yeah, more, mostly. Does how does your does your body wear down? Uh, okay, I I did not start from scratch. I built up uh, during several years, and when I started, I I started to run because I thought it was good for my chest, for concentration and focus and uh, all that. But then, yeah, I, I enjoyed running, and it's also good that it's so different to chess. In chess, you use your brain, you, you just sit there, and uh, when I run, I cannot use my brain at all. So I, I like this uh, contrast. Yeah, um, probably a good time for um, ideas to, to gestate, to, to grow. Um, so uh, when you run, are you like, an, do you listen to music or audiobooks or podcasts, or are you just alone in, in nature? For all those hours. Yeah. Uh, for now, we have a lot of friends here in uh, in my city. I'm running together with, so we're, we're discussing. Uh, oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sounds good. So, Axel, before before we let you go, I, we we got your four sort of improvement tenets along with play tournaments um, from pump up your rating. But do you have any sort of uh, closing advice for for our listeners, uh, whether it be chess or life advice? Uh, in chess, I would say just enjoy. Maybe that was not so much mentioned in Pump Up Your Rating. And for myself, I was, I think I was too, too ambitious, uh, too strict and too hard with myself uh, back then. So nowadays I enjoy chess more. And I think, yeah, you can do it and you can get results in the same time. And uh, what I've learned from chess, maybe it's just to live cheaply. Uh, uh, when you travel around, you don't have much things. You can yeah, just live with your laptop and uh, maybe a few clothes, maybe not. <laughs> and uh, I think this way of living, it's it's so easy. You uh, And nowadays, for me, as I said, uh, we don't buy any things, uh, mostly. So we need, we, we don't even need an income. For me, I can, I can stop working now and I can stop working for three years, four years. I'm not, I'm free. That's because uh, Woodpecker Method is a smash hit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but it's I, I could I could wish. <laughs> well, your success is well deserved, Axel. In any event, um, as I said, big fan of your books. Definitely recommend um, listeners check them out, especially listeners rated uh, say over sixteen hundred. But uh, I look forward to more projects in the future. Um, and if if anyone wants to reach you, Axel, you don't seem to be too active on any uh, social media. Is, or is your information public or you, do you prefer to, uh, to keep that information private? Uh, I think uh, my email, I have a uh, website, schackstudion.com. Uh, maybe schackstudion is not so easy to spell because it's Swedish. That's okay. I'll find it and, uh, and put a link to and it. I, so. I think uh, my email is there. Yeah, it, oh. it is there. Okay. All right, so it'll be a bit of a hunt for anyone who wants to email you, but we'll, but we'll put it in there. So, so Gr Grandmaster Smith, thank you again for for all of your contributions to chess literature, and thanks for um thanks for taking the time for this interview. Yeah, and thanks. For, nice to be here. Nice to, to talk to you. Okay, take care. Yeah, for you as Bye. well. Bye bye. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy. Thanks to you all for listening. And thanks to those of you who help spread the word, whether it be positive reviews on podcast platforms, telling friends, social media, all that stuff helps get the word out and it is much appreciated. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFischel1. You can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group to continue the conversation, sometimes even with that week's guests. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is back in action as well at Perpetual Chess. And you can also find all these links on the Perpetual Chess webpage, perpetualchesspod.com. But of course, the main purpose of these closing credits is to thank everyone who 
supports Perpetual Chess financially. Without you all, we would not be able to put out such a consistent and hopefully quality product. So thanks so much. It really means the world to me. And in particular, I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, starting off with my friends at chessable.com. Aside from that, I would like to thank David Lazarus of lasmanchess.com. He is the coach of Dave's Young Tigers on Lee Chess, our friends at Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, the Apprend Chess Twitch channel, A Needy Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Guvin Manet, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Mac- MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, the King's Crusher YouTube channel, one of the original chess YouTube channels, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the legendary Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nase Twitch channel, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Sodhi, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Reverend Roy Fry, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gerson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a chess.com improver group. You can look them up. Wayne Bean, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovics, Antonio Cancino, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Chad Hilton, Chess Potzer Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, also known as Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Corey Butson, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Emmanuel Langual, Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Fide Arbiter, Arbiter, Arbiter excuse me, Felipe Melo Perdera, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letart Lavoie, Frank Tor- Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zanani, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, Geert Vandervelde, Gene Stewart, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Han Shute, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Pari, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Dacumos, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John Tooley, Juan Almaguar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman of U.S. Chess, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, I am Kostya Kovutsky of the Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, 
Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gobel, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Malijanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management Limited in Switzerland, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Richard Hollenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Titi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott McKinnon, Scott Shepard, Sean Krause, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walter, Sergey Magacon, Seth Ruzicka, Shane Unger, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatyav Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rattel, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we will catch you all next week. 